We, we've let five more people in. If you're lucky, you're in. You're ready to go? Okay, yeah. All right, five minutes, and the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm very glad to be with you today, especially because that's... Oh, really? Okay. Is it better? Yeah. yeah. So I'm very excited to be with you today. Um, it's your birthday. That's great. And I have a present for you. This presentation is brand new. First time. Which means it is full of bugs. Right? <laughs> um, I wanted to do something very special here. Um, you know, I've been traveling the world uh, trying to talk about symphony, and, and at some point I have talked to people, real ones, uh, with real questions. And some questions come over and over again. So I have some answers here. So hopefully, after the talk, we can talk about something else and not about the regular questions I always have on Symphony. Anyway, um, let's start. So I'm not going to talk about uh, SymphonyCon Amsterdam. How many of you are going to be with us there? OK, cool, great. If you don't have your ticket, uh, there is a small uh, code here that you can use to get 10% off uh, the regular price. So hurry up. Um, we're going to be more than 1,000, probably. Um, I'm not sure if the, the, the program is already online. The schedule is not online yet, I think. Um, but I can tell you that we already have more than 600 people. Uh, yeah, that, that's huge. It's going to be really huge. OK. Are, are you all Symphony users here? Yes? OK. How many Laravel users do we have tonight? <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK, why not? Why why not? Why not? Why not? Why not? I think they're here because they know they need to use Symphony at some point. <laughs> okay, so uh, how many of you are still using Symphony 1? Any version? One person. Symphony 2? I mean, actively maintaining a project in production, right? Symphony 3? Symphony 4? Symphony 5. <laughs> okay. Okay. What is Symphony 4? And th that's, that's the very first question I want to talk about because um, there's a big difference between uh, what we have been doing with Symphony 3 and Symphony 4 versus what we had between Symphony 1 and Symphony 2, right? Big backward compatible changes between Symphony 1 and Symphony 2. That's not the case anymore. We can't break backward compatible not really in the sense that if we don't have a migration path from one version to the next, one major version to the next, we don't have compatibility. So it means that if you have a Symfony 3.4 application without any deprecation, you should be able to migrate to Symfony 4 easily without changing anything. That's the plan, at least, right? <laughs> but the thing is, if it is not the case, then it means that we have a bug, somehow, right? Um, but Symphony 4 is so Symphony 4 is not really about new features because we are not adding any new features in new major version. We are only adding add, we are only adding new features into minor version, right? So Symphony 5 is the same as Symphony 3 plus all the new features that we added uh, in Symphony 4 1, 4 2, 4 3, and 4 4. The big thing in Symphony 4 is the developer experience. It's totally different. And we're trying to improve it uh, by the day. And that's something I want to talk about. And that's also why we decided to um, um, stop maintaining Silex, because now you can use Symphony to develop prototypes, very small projects, and big ones with the same code base. And I think that that's very important. And that's something I'm, I'm going to talk a bit uh, today. So if you are a reader of the Wired, the magazine, you know that, that they have a section Wired and Tired. And I'm going to do that for, for a, a small few things. So the first one is don't use Aesthetic anymore. Right? You don't need to use it uh, because there are better things, more standard, uh, like Webpack. And if you are using Symfony, you can use Symfony Encore 
which makes the experience of using Webpack more symphony-ish, something like that. Um, the second one is don't use the PHP built-in server. Um, it's built-in, so if you have PHP, you do have the web server. Uh, the thing is, it has many limitations, and when you are developing even on your laptop locally, uh, it's better to use something more um, with more features. And um, we developed, actually I developed, a local web server a year ago. Uh, it's been available for a few months now. And um, how many of you have already tried to use the Symfony local web server? OK, not that many of you. OK, so cool. So uh, it's like any web server out there, really. So you download a Symfony CLI tool. Um, and then you have server start, minus D to go to the background. Uh, we have a few commands. And a few things that are really cool. So the first one is Symfony server log. If you're not using um, uh, the Symfony uh, web server, you, have, you are probably using Nginx plus PHP FPM, which means that you have a log file for your web server, for PHP, for your application, the Symfony application, and also probably for your uh, background commands. The Symfony server log aggregates everything into one um, command, so you have all the logs at, in, in one place. But it's much more than that. So the first thing is it, it uses PHP FPM. If it is available on your laptop, if it's not available, it falls back to FastCGI or PHP minus S if uh, that's the only thing that you have, which means that you have concurrent requests. And sometimes that's nice. Um, we also have support for HTTP2, TLS, local domain names, no dependencies, so it's not written in PHP, it's written in Go, which means that you have one binary that you can download. It works on any uh, version of your Mac, uh, Windows, or Linux. It can manage the background commands for you. So, and that's very important because nowadays with Symfony 4, you probably have some long-running commands, uh, like uh, consumer messages or running on core in a different um, web server. OK, so I talked about uh, the logs. Uh, we also have integration. I'm going to talk about that. Uh, it's really nice. Of course, integration with Symfony Cloud. And we do support multiple versions of PHP. So we detect all the versions that you have on your machine, and you can switch. Depending on the project, uh, you can switch from one version to the next. So you can use PHP 7.2 for one project, and PHP 5.6 for an old project that you still need to maintain. It works for any PHP project. So even if you are not using Symfony, if you are using Laravel or whatever, you can also use our plain PHP or plain HTML. You can also use the web server for that. And a few more uh, things. OK, so you can download it on symphony.com slash download. Um, easy enough. And that's also, so the Symfony CLI is a local web server, but it's much more than that. So the first thing you can use as well is if you want to create a new project, you can use Symfony new and the name of the directory you want to create your project in. Here, demo. It's exactly the same as create project, but create project, you need to remember that you need to use symphony slash skeleton for uh, the package name and a few other options. Here it's more straightforward. It also creates the Git repository for you if you have Git installed on your machine and a few more features. Uh, and some of them here, uh, so by default, we don't uh, output anything. If you have a problem, you can use minus minus debug. You can use minus minus cloud if you want to deploy to symphony cloud. And if you want to try Symfony 5, why not? You can use version dev master. Um, OK, so the Symfony CLI is also a replacement for the Sensual Lab security checker. Please, 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 stop using the Symfony security checker. Why? Because I'm paying for the server. And I can tell you that the traffic is huge, really huge. Um, and it's also, it's also great because Everything happens locally on your machine. So if you are using that in a CI or if you have, if you have an environment behind a firewall, for instance, it does not call anything outside with HTTP. The only thing it does is it clones uh, the Git repository, so the, the security advisories, and then it uses this as a local cache. So even if you don't have an internet connection, you can check the security of your um, project. So basically, it checks your composer.log file um, and, and trying to find out if you have some security problems uh, with the version that you have. OK, don't use Symfony slash Symfony anymore. Symfony slash Symfony is not something you need to use. 
it, it is not compatible with Symfony 4 if you are using Symfony Flex anyway. Um, and that, that's a great thing. Why is it? I think I have a slide about that. Um, yeah. So fir first thing, oh, okay. Okay. Um, so when we create a new project with Symfony 2 and Symfony 3 uh, using the Symfony Solid Edition, that's all the packages that you get, right? A lot of them. Most of them comes from Symfony, but a few of them comes from third-party um, developers like PHP Unit um, and Doctrine. And here it, it says 11, right? It could be too small to list all the packages from, from Doctrine here. So it's a, it's a lot of dependencies that you get when you create a new project. And probably some dependencies that you will not use. Here you have all the components from Symfony 2 and Symfony 3, everything that comes with Symfony slash Symfony, right? So even if you're not using, I don't know, whatever, the form component of Symfony, you have it. Not really a problem, just a few files in your vendor directory. But it also means that by default, the form subsystem is enabled, which means that you have a performance impact just because you have all the dependencies. So you need to manually disable the form subsystem if you're not using it. So you need to take care of that, uh, which is not nice. Oh, with form, it's much better. Uh, we only have, when you create a new project with Symfony 4 using the Symfony skeleton, uh, you only have uh, those dependencies. So something like 15 different uh, packages, right? It's really nice. That's all about the low-level uh, architecture of the website anyway. So we have some polyfills. Uh, we have uh, YAML to read configuration files, framework bundle because that's the glue between uh, all the components. Uh, the routing subsystem makes sense and things like that. Much better. The great consequence of that is that when you create, so that's the form again. So I create a new uh, demo project the bare minimum dependencies are installed, which means that the form are, are disabled because I don't have the Symfony form uh, dependency. If you require the form um, component, then all of a sudden Symfony knows that you have the form dependency so it can enable it automatically for you. So you don't need to take care of that. You always have the best performance possible just because we can detect which component you're going to use in your project, right? Okay. The great thing, oh, okay, so if you're not familiar with uh, Symfony 4 and Symfony Flex, so Symfony Flex is basically a composer plugin that helps with managing the dependencies on your project. So basically, when you are saying composer require form, it's exactly the same as Symfony slash form. So we have aliases, so you can also require uh, template or, or, or uh, ORM or admin or API, We're going to figure out which packages to actually install. That's very important because remember, we don't have all the Symfony components, so you need to install everything by hand. So for instance, if you want to debug your application, you probably want the profiler uh, bundle, you probably want the monologue bundle and a few other things. So we have aliases um, and that helps. So if you require profiler or test or debug, you need to install a bunch of things. Okay, uh, and the great thing also is that when you require form, everything is auto-configured for you. So there is no configuration, no manual changes in the end of whatever in the form subsystem directly. Uh, I, I get this one uh, a lot. So in Symfony 2 and Symfony 3, we have this concept of bundles. Bundles coming from um, outside developers, open source bundles that you can use to uh, add more features on your project, but also application bundles. Right, so when you create a project, you can, or you need, or you must, or you have to create uh, a bundle for your own code. Um, that's kind of confusing, really. Also because people uh, thought that it was a good idea to actually create many different bundles depending on the features, so one bundle per feature, which is really not something that you want to do. You need to create a bundle if it is totally independent from all the other bundles. If all your bundles depend on, on each other, they are not reusable, or a, bun a bundle should be reusable. So in Symfony 4, we decided to stop using bundles, but only for your application. Of course, we, also, we have bundles for open source projects that you can bring into your um, project, um, but for your own code, that's not the case anymore. 
So basically, the source directory is really about your code. And that's something that is really interesting in Symfony 4. Everything in your project directory is your code. And there is no Symfony anywhere. So we have a template directory. That's for your templates. No Symfony there. Source, your business logic. No Symfony there. Um, assets, only your assets managed by Webpack. No Symfony there. Um, and so it means also that in the namespace over there, it's app controller. There is no symphony. So the default namespace is app. That's your code. Okay, which is nice. Which also means that we have less subdirectories. We have source controller directly. We don't have source and then uh, symphony or sensor labs or your company name slash uh, bundle slash controller or whatever. It's much easier to navigate in your uh, project uh, directory structure. Okay, that's another one I have a lot. Uh, should I use environment variables or class constants or parameters? So the first thing you need to know is, okay, so at Christmas you have presents, right? And you have a new toy and you want to play with it a lot. That happens with developers as well. We give them environment variables and they want to do everything with environment variables. Please don't. Um, so I have a small table to help you with uh, that. Yeah, it's kind of complex. Uh, so you can still use parameters. Totally possible. Environment variable. Basically, you need an environment variable when you want to configure the infrastructure. So a database password, for instance, that makes sense. Something that you don't want to commit into your Git repository, that makes sense. Something that you want to change without redeploying your project, yes. But the number of blog posts that you need to display on your screen, no, that's not an environment variable. You don't need to change it without redeploying. Without, that's, that's something you, you can have as a class constant, for instance. Um, okay. Everybody has a picture of that? <laughs> yes? Okay. Service configuration, and that's something, you know, people kept talking about how Symfony is a lot about changing configuration, configuring your services, configuring the routing, and things like that. That's a thing of the past, not in Symfony 4. You can create applications without changing anything in the configuration, um, and without registering any service in your uh, container, because we have a bunch of features doing that for you most of the time, that works out of the box. So anything in your source directory can be uh, auto-wired automatically. That is a very small example. I have uh, my default controller here. It was using a, a response, a very simple one, um, without twig. I've made just, you know, I require twig. That's an alias, another one. And I've changed uh, my controller that, like that. So that the controller is defined nowhere. The controller is now a service, which means that you can inject anything. So here I'm just saying, okay, I want a Twig environment. Symfony, do whatever you want. I want a Twig environment. That's your job. And then I can render uh, a template, and the template, as you can see at the bottom of the screen, is under the template directory. Right? Very simple. Um, so I don't need any configuration. Everything is auto-wired. And that's, that's a great developer experience, really. Whenever you need something, you can type in your dependency and Symfony is going to do um, whatever it takes to actually uh, inject uh, something uh, that is relevant to you. Which means that your productivity is really much better and you can take your time implementing the business logic that you need for your project. So most of the time you don't need to define your service. Uh, it's done uh, for you. Okay. Now. Symfony Flex and, and the way we actually manage dependencies is great. Auto configuration of the container is great. But how do you get started? How do you create your first classes when you create a project, a new, brand new project? The answer is the maker bundle. It's huge. It's much better than the generator bundle that we had in Symfony 2 and Symfony 3. For one big reason. In Symfony 2 and Symfony 3, whenever we wanted to generate something, we needed to generate PHP classes, we needed to generate PHP files, YAML configurations, we needed to change and 
update files. That's not the case in Symfony 4. Most of the time, make a bundle when, when you are generating something, it generates just one file, which makes things much better and much easier to implement. That's the number of things that you can do uh, with the Symfony Maker bundle. Um, basic stuff like creating a new command or a new controller, and advanced stuff like a registration form, for instance. I've tried that. I've, I, I've never tried before. Uh, so I tried that for you two days ago. That works. That's cool. Uh, OK, a unit test, a user, um, a voter, a lot of things. OK, so that's how you can create a, a controller, uh, make controller, default controller. It creates one file, just works, done. And we have opinionated um, choices baked in uh, the maker bundle. So that's the file that is generated by uh, the command. As you can see, we are using annotations because we think that it's way better to have everything in one file instead of different files, which makes also much easier for us to generate the file, of course. Um, <laughs> tell me you're not lazy. Um, and, okay. and here, as you can see, we are returning JSON because I don't have Twig. But if I require Twig and then generate a new controller, it's going to use Twig by default. So you have a, a few tweaks like that uh, in the Maker Bundle. Now, I want to give you a concrete example of something that is much better with Symfony uh, version 4. Adding a Twig extension. Okay. How many of you know exactly how to create a Twig extension with Symfony 2 or Symfony 3 without reading the documentation and without Google? <laughs> I can't. I can't. There are so many questions. So the first where do I need to store my Twig extension class? Is it under the source Twig directory or Twig extension? What is the best practice? First question. Then, which interface do I need to implement? Do you know the interface name? How many of you know the interface name? Or, do we have an abstract class that we need to extend? Hmm, I don't remember. The answer is, there is an abstract class. Um, which file do I need to change to register my new extension in the service container? And if it is an extension, it needs to be registered on Twig, so it means that I need to add a tag. Do you know the syntax to add a tag in YAML? I don't. No, I mean, I know now, because, you know, I, I've, I've that's an old slide, so I know now. Because that's an array first, and then you, can add, and then you have a hash when you have um, the tag name, but I don't remember the tag name. And then you can have more um, parameters there. OK, so at some point, I'm, I'm sure that a bunch of you have done exactly that. You say, ah, that's complex. Let's do everything in the controller. It's going to be fine, right? No, it's not. So you know, some people are going to tell you that I'm talking about best practices. OK, small parenthesis here. I don't like best practices or good practices or whatever because they really depend on a lot of different factors. Laravel best practices, not the same as Symfony best, best practices, right? I'm not saying they are better or worse, just different. <laughs> and depending on, no, I mean, even depending on the skills of your developers, the best practices are going to be different. Depending on whether you are developing a very small website, or a website that you need to maintain over a long period of time, the best practices are going to be different. So best, practicing, best practices equal bullshit. <laughs> anyway, so let's add a Twig extension. I'm going to use the maker bundle, make Twig extension. I have one file, done. No configuration to change, no question, nothing. I don't need Google, I don't need the documentation. The only thing is I need to implement the business logic I need to implement for my um, code, right? That's cool. The full automation is not just for Twig extension. It's for a, a lot of different things. So it works for event listeners, doctrine entities, commands, voter, the registration for syst form system, and, and, and much more than that. And we are adding more over time. 
So the registration for, from system is quite new, actually. Okay, don't use, don't use PHP. You know that, right? So the thing is, some people post comments on blog posts and on Twitter and, and things like that, social media. Uh, saying, ah, oh, I want to use PHP as a templating system with Symfony. Really? Nobody's doing that. And I, I can prove that nobody's do, is doing that. Because during the last five years, we did not change anything in the PHP templating system of Symfony. Not a single thing. So, two possibilities here. The first one, no bugs. <laughs> I know, I read the code. It's perfect. I'm not sure. Second reason, nobody is using it. And just, just, just an example. We have bootstrap support for Twig. Nobody ever asked the same for the system. Nobody. So. And of course, you can use PHP if you want. Why not? And that's brand new. And in Symfony for free, we have the Symfony Mailer component, and it's going to be a replacement for Swift Mailer. Um, and, and the Symfony Mailer component is much better than Swift Mailer for many reasons. But the first one is that we are building Symfony Mailer on top of all the good things of Symfony. And it makes it really easier to actually implement the Mailer. If you have a look at the code, we have actually two different components. The first one is mine, and the second one is Mailer. And if you have a look at the mailer component, it's really just about sending emails. There is nothing else, because everything else is infrastructure provided by Symfony. That's, you know, okay, okay. That's the best part. Ready? That's magic. Uh, I, I love it. So I will send emails from my computer. How many of you are sending emails in their applications? Everybody, right? Okay, uh, so I require Symfony Mailer. I ask Symfony to give me a Mailer interface implementation. Don't care about um, which one, at least for now. And the configuration actually comes from the DSN. So by default, when I install the Symfony Mailer, I have uh, this DSN, which is using SMTP on my local host machine. Makes sense. Um, and then I can send a, an email. Right, so I'm creating an email instance, I'm sending the email instance. That's basically what you would do with uh, Swift Miller as well, right? Not very different. Much more efficient, I can tell you. Okay, the thing is, you don't want to send an hello world email. You want to send a rich email. Yeah? You can do that really easily. Instead of using an email, I'm using a templated email. Instead of setting the HTML content email, I give it an HTML template, the context. More or less what you would do with a regular uh, controller where you want to send an HTML page, right? And that's only my second slide on uh, that uh, topic of sending emails. And already you can see that doing the same thing with most impossible. It's much more complex. You need to install a third-party bundle that is not maintained anymore. Uh, it doesn't work with recent version of Symfony, so it's built in now. But of course, you also want responsive emails, right? Okay. Um, so I've installed two extensions, Twig extension. The first one is CSS inliner because you need to inline your CSS um, in your emails. If not, some clients won't work. And then I have installed the inking extension, which gives you a bunch of um, tags. You can see container, row, columns, so that you can build your email semantically. And then it's going to convert that to HTML that works in any email client. So that's a very simple example. I don't have many columns, but you can do uh, more than one column if you need to. OK. So remember, I'm using SMTP, but of course, I don't want to do that. You don't want to send emails with, with your own SMTP server. What you want to be able to use is a provider 
I want to be able to use a provider API. Again, not possible with Swift Mailer. And if you are using something else, most of the time they are okay to send uh, basic emails but not reach responsive emails easily. To do that, um, I need to choose from uh, the mailers that we have. So that's the one we have by default right now. We can add more over time. Or put another way, that's the ones I have coded at some point. You are more than welcome to actually implement some other ones. That's the main ones, really. Here, I, I've, I've installed Mailgun. And the only thing I need to change is the DSN. Here, I'm saying I want to use Mailgun using the API. HTTP here. I can use the SMTP version of, of Mailgun by using SMTP and then the exact same thing. So you need to figure out your key and your name, that's all. No configuration to change, no code to change. And that's the big one, of course. I don't want to send my emails synchronously. Of course, I don't want my you know, HTTP request to be blocked by um, an email. So I want to send my emails asynchronously. I'm going to use this, the, the Symfony Messenger. Um, so I require Messenger, and I, uh, I forgot to mention, all the code, all the configuration that you need, everything is on the screen, right? There is no configuration that you need to do and it's not on the screen. Everything is on the screen. So, it com so the Messenger comes with a default configuration. Here I have just changed the transport, the default transport. I'm going to use Doctrine, easy enough. And then I'm saying that whenever I have a send email message, I want to use the email uh, transport. Which means that now, whenever I want to send email in the controller, it's going to be stored in the database, and I need to use the messenger consume a command to actually consume the messages from the doctrine queue and send the emails. Locally, I can use symphony run minus D, which is going to do the exact same thing as before, but in the background. And that's where Symfony server log does its magic because then all the logs from this command are going to be streamed in the output, which is nice. Yeah, and, when I'm, when I'm, and, and that's the only thing, right? So now I don't need to change the controller. Just because I have this configuration, my emails are going to be sent asynchronously. So, and that's a very nice thing of the messenger component. You don't need your code. That's only about the configuration. Um, okay, so that's about the logs. You can see if you say Symfony server status, then you have the web server and you can see that it's also, um, it also manages the command that I have um, ran, ran in the background. Wow, that's already a lot. But you know, we, we've barely scratched the surface of what you can do. So you can do that with AMQP. I don't want to use Doctrine for that. That's not a queue, right? So I want to use AMQP or RabbitMQ here. How can I do that? Okay. I'm tired now. <clears throat> so, your turn. How much time do you think it would take for you to do everything on the Simply Free? Yeah, I will try. Honestly, yes. No, never, ever. Okay. And here we have only used built in components of Symfony right? or Twig, that's the same. So we want to use AMQP. <coughs> It's getting complex. Okay, so um, what I've done here is, so I need RabbitMQ, so I need to install RabbitMQ somehow. Here I've decided to actually use uh, Docker. So I've created a Docker Compose YAML file. I want uh, a service named RabbitMQ. The image is RabbitMQ, and I want to expose the port. Everybody is familiar with Docker? Yes? Yes. Yes? Yes! Okay. No? More. Okay, so this is the port of 
the container itself, not the port from the outside, right, from the locals. It's going to be random, which is cool, because it means that I can work on different projects in parallel with different containers that are going to have different ports. Um, and, and so I can work on, on, on several projects in parallel without any problem. So, so that's the first thing. Then I ran Composer up uh, in the background. And I'm going to change the transport DSN. I'm going to use a, an environment variable named rabbitmq underscore DSN. That's all. Nothing more. The magic happens because I'm using the Symfony Local Web Server. The Symfony Local Web Server detects that you are using Docker. And if you have a look at the profiler, you can see uh, this small icon here. And Docker Compose is up. Then it knows that you are using RabbitMQ. The service name is RabbitMQ. So it exposes uh, an environment variable named RabbitMQ underscore GSN and a few other ones. Right? It does the exact same thing with uh, MySQL, PostgreSQL, Redis, um, and a few other ones. Right? So it's literally just about creating the Docker Compose and changing the environment variable there. That's all. Just works. Okay, I'm not done yet because, of course, at some point, uh, Melgun is going to be down, right? It might have a problem, so I want to manage the failures somehow. First possibility, you can use another provider. So here I have um, installed SendGrid Mailer, and the DSN is use Melgun, and if Melgun is down, then use SendGrid. That works. That's also a nice trick, you know, because all those providers, they have uh, a number of emails that you can send per month for free. <laughs> okay. The other possibility, and you can mix and match, is you can say, okay, for the email transport, I want a retry strategy. I want to retry three times. Okay, so it's going to try three times, and if it doesn't work, then it's going to discard the message, right? But I don't want, I want to have a look at the failed messages. So I create a failure transport, and the name of the transport is failed, and here I'm going to use doctrine. I think it makes sense. If some, if some messages can't be sent, then I want something that is drug. I want something in the database, and then, I can use messenger failed show to show all uh, the failed messages and I can retry manually um, if that makes sense. That's the kind of output that you have. So you can see the message, you can see um, the failed attempt to deliver the message and a few other things. And if you are using minus VV, then you will have uh, the stack trace and everything you need to debug the problem. Ha -ha. Ha -ha. I don't want to use Docker. And actually, I'm not using Docker at all. Um, okay, so I don't want to use Docker. Or put another way, I want to use something that works also in the production environment. Right? How many of you are using Docker in production? Okay, quite a lot. Okay, so it also works with uh, Symfony Cloud. So that's basically the same configuration that we had before with Docker, uh, with a few tweaks. So the first one is the services.yml file, which is almost the same as the Docker Compose. So I declare a RabbitMQ uh, service. I can configure it uh, somehow. Then I'm um, going to add it uh, to my uh, symphony.cloud.yml file. And here, this is how you can create a worker, basically saying that I want to consume the emails. Symfony project init to create uh, uh, the template for those files and Symfony deploy, that's all. Everything is managed automatically for you. Um, and then you can, you can have the logs here, um, which is going to be the logs of the uh, consumer. And that's production ready. You don't need to manage anything. Uh, we are doing that for you. The great thing about that is that um, so you have deployed your project on Symfony Cloud, and you have a bunch of branches. Right? 
one pair. And the great thing about Symfony Cloud is that we are actually uh, duplicating all your services with the data. So you have your server in production and you have uh, a PostgreSQL database, for instance. You have a bunch of data in there and you have a bunch of things on your um, local face system and things like that. When you create a new branch, we deploy a new environment, which is the exact same thing as uh, the environment that you have in production, including the data, which means that you can almost debug like you were in production. Right? If you, have, if you are old like me, back in the days, we were using FTP to debug things directly on the production servers. That's the same feeling. But the great thing is that, so you create a branch, um, and then you can open a tunnel. And opening a tunnel means that all the services that you have uh, in the cloud are accessible locally. And of course, the Symfony Local Web Server is aware of that. So you can see here that the tunnel is open, which means that we have the same trick as with Docker, which means that you can use RabbitMQ underscore DSN. It's going to be the DSN of your RabbitMQ server for the branch you are currently in, in the cloud. Right? That also works for PostgreSQL, which means that you can test things locally on your machine with the production database, with the data from your production environment, which is really nice if you want and if you need to debug uh, uh, edge cases or, or bugs. That's the new Symfony experience, um, and that's possible because of a lot of things a bunch of new components. So I've talked about the mailer, but the mailer depends on the messenger, it depends on HTTP client to do the, the provider APIs um, calls, on the, the auto configuration for the container, um, the env environment variables, it uses Flex, and a few tools like Docker and Symfony CLI and things like that. So it took some time because it means, you know, we needed a bunch of things, of different tools and building blocks to be able to actually develop this new uh, Symfony experience. So it took us a few years to get there. But I think it's, it's very, very interesting and, 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 and the productivity is really much better than what you had before. Blah, blah, marketing something. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, how many of you were not aware of everything I've talked about? I thought that Symphony Three was Symphony Four was almost the same experience as Symphony Three. Put another way, have you learned something tonight? Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> what about the future? Never ever ask for new features in Symphony Five. Ooh, that doesn't make any sense. Right? Ask for. What are we going to have as new features in Symfony 4.4? Yes, I can talk about that. So Symfony 5 is, just so that you really understand everything, Symfony 5 is the exact same thing as Symfony 4.4, minus all the deprecated features, that's all. Um, and probably a bump in uh, the PHP dependency, the minimum version. The first one. This one is great, because more and more people are using Symfony to create APIs. They don't care about Twig. If you don't care about Twig, why not? Uh, but you have a problem right now because all the great error messages are done with Twig, which means that you need to install Twig just for the HTTP errors. Right? If you want to have an XML HTTP error or a JSON one, you need Twig, which is not really nice. It's something that we are working on. It's not much yet, but it's going to be merged for Symfony 4.4, uh, which means that with Symfony 4.4, we, we are going to have great HTTP errors depending on the format that you have without using Twig. The second one is Symfony um, no, PHP 7.4 pilot support. <laughs> yeah? Performance for free. That's always nice. Uh, Nicholas is working on that. Actually, we reverted uh, the pull request today, uh, so it's not really accurate anymore, but we are working on that. It's going to be available in Symfony uh, 4.4. A better security component. That's a huge one. 
I'm not going to talk about that. There are two issues if, if you want to learn more about that, but it's really about making the experience much better. Uh, OAuth su support, it's about um, decoupling the user and the token. It's about uh, being able to be, to, to being able to do uh, two-factor authentication really easily of other things. Those two issues are really uh, interesting. Uh, and we need help because it's going to be a huge amount of work. So for today, thank you and see you soon. <laughs> um, that, that's a great question and I have, all, I have it all the time. I totally forgot about that. So the local web server is called local web server, local like local host, like your local machine, lo local server. Yeah? It's not production ready. It will never be. It's totally different. Uh, the local web server is optimized for your development experience. It is not optimized for performance. Far from it. There are many shortcuts. Um, so I would not recommend you to use it in production. Never, ever. Any more questions or like 50 questions? <laughs> there is one over there. Okay, I'm going to. I guess I still need to use this, right? Yeah. Uh, so thanks. First of all, uh, I think simply something that all languages can be envious of. However, can you, can you talk a bit about um, the HTTP kernel to middlewares? Is that something that ever is going to happen or is that just too big of a disruption to the, to the ecosystem or, or, or any other reason? Yeah. Okay. I can answer that. Uh, there are many reasons, really. Many, 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 many reasons. So first of all, first of all, buzzwords. I don't care about middleware. I don't know what middleware is. You know, just because it's fun or great or hype to have middleware, so that's the first reason. I don't care about that. And the great thing is that if you want middleware, you can use Symfony version 1 and you do have middleware there. <laughs> and actually, I think it's before Symfony 1.2, if I remember correctly. So we did have middleware at some point. The second reason is that we really care about backward compatibility. So if we are not able to provide a path, a migration path from what we have today to what you would want to have tomorrow, if we don't have that path, we won't do it. We don't want to break back our compatibility without a migration path. Second reason. The third one is, why would you want middleware instead of listeners and even dispatcher? Why is it better? I can give you a few reasons why it is actually much better to have listeners rather than middleware. I don't have any reason to actually say, okay, middleware is better because some. I have not. Uh, do you want another one? <laughs> Backward compatibility. I mean, that's the big one. That's really the big one. So, the maker bundle evolves because people actually contribute something there. Uh, so, if you want DTO support, for instance, why not? The thing is, it's only an option. It should always be optional. Remember, 
best practices are bullshit, right? So DTOs, they are nice to solve some problems. I would not recommend all the application out there to actually use DTOs because sometimes you don't need that level of abstraction, right? Um, so it cannot be built in into Symfony. I think it does, would not really make sense to actually have something built in. Uh, so it's, it's really about the documentation, mainly. So documenting how you can use DTOs for ABC. And if there is enough people willing to help, then trying to find out a way to actually bring something useful in the Maker bundle. But that, that's exactly the future that we want. We want to help uh, bootstrapping projects and, and trying to um, get out of the way and, and trying to generate things as much as possible and, 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 and also giving you the freedom to change everything, right? And that's very important. So when you are using Symfony Flex, you don't need to configure anything. We are using Flex and auto configuration, auto wiring and things. You don't need to configure er anything, but that's at any point in time, if you want to fall back to do something manual, you can. You can disable all the magic, all the things that are done automatically, and then write something that works for you. That's also possible. So I would love to use your uh, new uh, Maker uh, application, uh -huh. but with Apache. What now? What? With Apache. So no local uh, web server, no uh, cloud? Oh, you can. Just Apache. So how would the, the, the configuration that you just shown uh, be changed? So if, if you want to use AMQP, for instance, to send emails, you would have to... No, the whole environment. What do you mean, the whole environment? So the examples were shown with uh, the local web server running, and you say that uh, if you use, the, for instance, the cloud, uh, then the, uh, all the environment uh, variables will automatically be yeah. set up. But if you just use a normal... Um, like a, your, yeah. your own deployment. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the question is, he doesn't want to use Symfony Cloud. He <laughs> <laughs> doesn't want to use the local web server. Not yet. Which is fine. <laughs> which is fine. You are on your own. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, I can't do the magic if you are not using the tools, but. Basically, everything I've talked about, you can, you, you can do the same with um, any web server, so you can use Apache or Nginx, no problem. The only thing is then, you need to manage the Docker environment yourself, which means that you need to create the environment variables somehow. That's all. Right? That's, all. That's the only difference. That's a big one. You had a question. Um, if someone has already created an app bundle, is it, is it easy to undo? saying that you shouldn't create your own app bundle. Yeah. 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 Basically, it's about a namespace and one file named bundle, extending the bundle or in implementing the, the bundle interface. So you remove uh, the bundle interface. You can change namespaces. And that's all. Except if you have some, um, if you have a, an extension. So if you have some semantic configuration, then you need to register that. But most of the time, people don't have that. So it should be relatively easy. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> okay, so, so three questions in one. Um, what's your, <laughs> short ones. Uh, what's your, what's your, uh, your vision for, for Twig? Um, why do you stress there's a difference between symphony projects and Twig? And how to contribute? So first of all, Twig is not dead. I'm here. No, I mean, I love Twig. I love, I love the code base, the fact that we are free to do whatever we want in the language. We're not tied to PHP. We can evolve the language the way we want. If you have a look, if you have a look at the repository, you can see that we did, okay, I did a lot of changes during the last six months, a bunch of them, really. And we are in the process of publishing some blog posts on symphony.com about that. The first one was published today or yesterday. And there are three more about uh, the future of 
of, of Twig, so all the features that we have now uh, and the future of that. So basically, I have Twig version 1, Twig version 2, and I've started to work on, on Twig version 3. Uh, and I'm going to maintain all three versions. At some point, I will probably not add new features anymore in Twig 1, but we can maintain for birds. Maintaining. I think we are at a point where we have almost all the features I want in Twig, and that are still in the issue queue. Not a lot. Want to contribute? You are more than welcome. Okay. You will see, and we can talk about that afterwards, but there are a few issues to work on. Um, I don't remember. Uh, I know that there is one about the file system loader, uh, and there is a pull request as well, but I did not have time to work on that. Oh, I know one thing is ENTL. There are a bunch of um, issues in the Symphony and the t Twig issue queue uh, talking about ENTL and, and a better support for ENTL. And I think that now that we have a very strong support um, in Symphony and the Symphony components. And now, all users of Twig need to use Composer, which was not the case two years ago. We can add more dependencies. So I think now, we're building ENTL support in Twig thanks to the Symphony components. So that's something you can work on. If you're interested in doing that or anyone here, send me an email because I have a bunch of issues and pull requests, some references that you can understand um, all the, the ideas from other people on this topic. And there are a couple of them uh, in, in the issue queue as well. Yeah, so it's not dead. And also because when you are sending emails, you need to use Twig. So, just make sure. I'm very happy because now I have one feature that you can't switch to JavaScript. The <laughs> <laughs> quotation. So uh, I've been finding simple implementation uh, a bit lacking in the uh, respect that it's very good when you're starting, uh, like the general things and everything. But as a developer, it would be like years and years at this point. Uh, I'm starting to hit a wall where I basically need to read the code on a, on a bit more advanced usage of uh, some of the components and things. Yeah. So I'm wondering if there is a plan to maybe tackle the documentation and make it uh, better? Okay. Um, so the, the thing is, we have a lot of people working on the documentation. And if you read the documentation a year ago, two years ago, uh, the current version is very different. So from time to time, we take one topic and we try to change all the things that are not up to date anymore, obsolete, or just because the way we are doing things is a bit different. Um, and also because we accumulated a bunch of different small articles on very specific topics and at some point we realized that it would be much better to have one article with everything in there or on the contrary we have one big article and we decide to s split um, in different uh, articles on <coughs> very specific topics. Sorry? One, yeah, you can do that. It's called a PDF. <laughs> um, so I think th then it's also a matter of people um, asking us to work on something very specific if there are advanced uh, usages that are not documented yet it's, it's, really, it's possible uh, it's really difficult to keep up with, with the code because you know we are adding new features all the time so we have people um, that are writing new documentation or documentation on new features. We also have people trying to organize documentation the best way we can. That's a lot of work, really. So we also need help there. So the, the, the very basic stuff is just saying, okay, I think this part of, of Symphony is not documented at all, or 
mm, it's not you know enough or writing documentation is also a nice thing to do I can, I can suggest do the evil thing do what the geek does the framework yeah they basically you have to if you do a pull request you have to change the documentation they do not accept your pull yeah. request Okay. That, okay. We can talk about that. I can talk. Yeah, uh, we can talk about that, and, and we tried that, and it, it's very complex, very difficult, and it also depends on the number of pull requests that you have and you get. We merge on average uh, six to seven pull requests per day. Um, right now, the queue is is at two hundred pull requests. If we start asking people to write documentation for every single feature, the c number of contributions going to go down and then I'm going to have 1,000, 2,000 pull requests open. So at some point, you know, we need to be pragmatic and say, so what we are doing now, and we have been doing that for a couple of weeks, I think, is that whenever we merge a pull request that is a new feature, automatically we create a, an issue um, in the documentation to remember that we need to document something. The, first thing. the second one is when I know that the guy submitting the pull request is able to write the documentation, I ask him or her to write the documentation. But I'm not going to block all the contributors because we know that a lot of developers are not able to write good documentation. That, that's not their thing. It's, it's a skill to actually write documentation. Um, it, and it's, it's something very difficult. It's very time consuming as well. Whenever I write, you know, some code for one hour, we need two hours for the documentation. The great thing about documentation is realizing that you have things that do not work the right way, right? You are not able to explain the new feature. And if, if you're not able to explain a new feature, it means that the code is bad. Yeah, but I would love, you know, to have all pull requests with documentation pull request associated with it. I would love to. It's just not possible. Open documentation having the like pull requests to update uh, documentation from the community as a separate stream apart from the pull request of code, so the community contributes to the documentation. Some projects do that. You mean two different repositories, depending on the kind yeah. of documentation? Open sourcing. It is. <laughs> it is open source. So the community can documentation. Yeah. So if you yeah, sure. out this person, as a developer, okay, this documentation is not up to spec for me, and I found out this advanced usage now. We have That's we have wrong. we have a documentation team and it's open and and, and if you have a look, we have hundreds of people contributing to the documentation. Symphony so we, slash docs. yeah. So it's Symphony slash Symphony dash docs. Last one. Last one. Scream. Yes. So you want me to talk about Docker? Really? <laughs> so first of all, are you able to be sure of that the configuration that you have in Docker that works today is going to work in the exact same way in six months from now? Is it replicable? I, th I don't think so. No, I mean, just you, 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 you you clone your repository with your Docker files. You run Docker. And I'm pretty sure that you are going to have something different from the production that you deployed uh, six months ago. Yeah, but it depends on the same type of Docker. Hmm? Yeah. But I'm pretty sure that most of you have problems, which means that you don't have the exact same thing. 
far from it. But anyway, that's another topic. So that's a very good question, actually. Uh, so the thing is, so we have uh, support for Docker, which means that you, uh, you can have all the services as Docker um, containers, everything but the PHP environment. And I really like that because it is really fast to develop that way. I have PHP locally on my machine, the web server is local. I don't have any issue with you know, um, NFS or whatever you're using nowadays with Docker uh, locally on your machine. Uh, it's really fast, and I really like to, to have a fast environment locally on the machine. So it means that it's really a matter of having the same PHP version and having the same extensions. Basically, that's all. If we're talking about Nginx configuration, most of the time it's really basic. So it's really about web front controller and, and probably some redirection rules or whatever, something like that. So it's not huge. The big thing is making sure that you have the same version of all the services and making sure that you have you know, everything that is consistent um, among the services. But I, I, I'm not sure that it's really, it, it, it's nice if you can have everything exactly the same in production and local server, but I'm pretty sure that you don't have that with Docker nowadays anyway. So I prefer performance over having the exact same thing. Not really. Oh, because I'm a very good developer. That's why. <laughs>